each Lent, the first Sunday of the season is about the temptation in the desert, and the second Sunday is always uh, Jesus' transfiguration. And it kind of traces out for us, um, really, the spiritual journey of our lives, right? The desert speaks so much about uh, just the depths of, like, how low we've fallen and uh, the human condition that we live in. Uh, you know, Jesus being in the desert, um, the desert that's there by the Jordan River and around the Dead Sea, that's the lowest place on earth. And so it, it kind of speaks, the lowest place on the surface of the earth, you know, it kind of speaks to our, our human condition uh, and, and our need to resist sin and temptation. And then going up the mountain today, this need to, to rise above even earthly desires, if at the summit we are going to see God face to face. And that's all got to be fueled by a desire to see God face to face. As we heard in Psalm 27, of you my heart has spoken, seek his face. Your face, O Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face. Right? It's got to be fueled with this desire to see God face to face. Um, because the, the journey is it's too arduous. We got to want it. We got to want it. And seeking God face, seeking to see him face to face, it would do us no good unless he revealed himself, right? Unless there was some way that we could actually come to see him face to face, right? Of you my heart has spoken, seek his face. Hide not your face from me, O Lord, the psalmist says. And in another psalm it says, I shall know the fullness of joy when I see your face, O Lord. But how can we seek his face unless it can be found? And so we have here with the transfiguration a little glimpse into heaven. That first of all, God has taken on a human face in Jesus in sending his son. And up to this point in the gospel, you know, we see Jesus, he's preaching and he's working miracles. And right before the transfiguration, you have Peter's confession, where you have this first explicit belief that this is the Christ, the son of the living God. That on the human face of Jesus is revealed the divine face of God, or rather hidden in the human face of Jesus, is God's own face. And so right after, you kind of get to this sort of climax in the gospel. You also have Jesus' first prediction of his suffering. Right after Peter confesses that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus, first, for the first time, tells them that he's got to suffer that he is going to Jerusalem where he will be rejected, he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and they will put him to death. And that, of course, shakes their faith, right? And so he tells them that there are some standing here who will not taste death before they have seen the kingdom of God come in power. And eight days later, he takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain and they see him transfigured before them. The thing with the transfiguration, you know, if God's going to reveal himself, I think every human being on the face of the earth would expect something like the transfiguration. This, this radiant light show of divine glory, right? But what's really interesting is that Jesus, he does this in private with only three of his disciples. And it's interesting, too, when you contrast it with the third temptation last week, Satan took Jesus up to the parapet of the temple and told him, if you are the Son of God, 
Then throw yourself from the parapet of this temple. For he has given command to his angels that they shall bear you upon their hands lest you strike your foot against a stone. Basically what Satan was tempting Jesus with was reveal yourself to be the son of God. Give the people in the temple a show. Let them see you suspended in the air, being held up by angels. Prove to them that you are the son of God. And Jesus tells him, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, referring to his father. And yet today we have Jesus, and it's while he was praying to his father, not at the suggestion of the devil tempted to vainglory, but while in prayer with his father, that by the Father's will, Jesus was transfigured and his divine glory shone forth for the apostles. You see, God can appear to us in such a way, but what would that say about his character? That basically God would have an ego, that he's out for vainglory, There's a reason why the gospel doesn't stop with the transfiguration and why it goes to Mount Calvary and not the Mount of Transfiguration. You see, God wants us to see him. We had that prayer, uh, the opening prayer for Mass today, that by listening to his son, as the Father commands us in the gospel, that by listening to his son, our sight would be purified so that we can see him rightly. The world expects divine glory. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, that's, that's what we would expect, the transfiguration, if God was to reveal himself. But the fullness, I shouldn't say the fullness, But perhaps the most important moment of God's revelation to us wasn't the transfiguration. It was the cross. The cross when he is stripped of divine glory, of all that would attract us to him superficially. So that we could see rightly that God is self-sacrificial love and not just some divine light show but that at the core of who he is, he is self-sacrificing love. And so that's what he calls us to, to purify our sight so that we don't just fall in love with his glory, but fall in love with him. That we see clearly the truth of who he is that he is self-sacrificing love. The devil's temptation was to get the world to believe in Jesus, but through vainglory, which would have stopped short of seeing God as he truly is, as self-sacrificing love. John, going up the mountain and witnessing the transfiguration, would later write, in his letter, that God is love, that he isn't just loving, but that God himself is love. That wasn't because he saw the transfiguration. It's because he saw Christ crucified. That's the truth of who our God is. And so while this moment of transfiguration is an important moment of revelation, it's an important moment really of confirmation confirming the truth that, yes, Jesus really is the Son of God, in order to firm up the faith of his apostles, Peter, James, and John, who already came to faith that he is the Son of God. It was to strengthen them for the cross because the even fuller revelation of who God is, that's a lot to take in. And I think that's true even for each of us. I am much more comfortable 
with a divine light show than to confront the fact that I am that loved by divine majesty. That Jesus going to the cross says, I was worth that burden? Whoa. But that's the fullness, that's the much more fuller revelation of our God. That our God is the God of self-sacrificing love. And so let that fuel your desire to see him as he truly is. To recognize in Jesus, just like the centurion, that this is just not just another man on a cross. I mean, there were thousands of people who were crucified in Jesus' day. But why was it, for instance, that the centurion could look at this man and say, truly, this man was the son of God? A centurion who himself would have crucified God knows how many people. What made this man so different? How did the centurion see the hidden face of God through the crucified son? Nobody dies like Jesus died. Nobody goes to their crucifixion with forgiveness on their lips, praying for the very ones who put him there. So powerful is God's revelation on the cross. Let his love fuel your desire to make that arduous journey from the desert up the mountain of God, persevering in your practices of resisting sin and dedicating yourselves to prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, climbing up that arduous mountain of the Lord to see our God face to face. O Lord, of you my heart has spoken. Seek his face. Thy face, O Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face.